So what we're going to do now is we're going to bring up our first speaker. Um, I know that I'm going to get you set up here first, Tom, before you come up, and I'm going to introduce you. Here, now let me introduce you, Tom. Okay. All right. Thank you. Our first speaker is Thomas Straka. Uh, Thomas Straka is a professor emeritus at Clemson University in South Carolina. He's a professional forester and forest economist by training. He earned a BS and MS in forestry at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and an MBA at uh, South Carolina, University of South Carolina, and a PhD in forest management at Virginia Tech. He's experienced as a forester working for International Paper Company and was on the faculty at Mississippi State University. His interest is in charcoal kilns is related to the forest that supported the charcoal burning industry, which my family was involved in back a long, long time ago. He has researched charcoal kilns in, in the few areas that still contain concentrations of kiln remnants. One of those is the Upper Peninsula. And so speaking about these vanishing ghosts of Michigan's Upper Peninsula charcoal iron industry, Dr. Thomas Straka. Thank you. Good morning. About a year ago, I wrote an article for Upper Country. That's the Upper Peninsula Studies Journal. And I wasn't trying to do it. I, I was, I didn't, I didn't intentionally do it. I couldn't have written a better article just listening to your introduction because it turned out to be about historical uh, preservation and it turned out to be tourism. I, it was just an underlying theme that was there. And it was serendipity listening to you. It was also opportunities lost. And, and I guess I, this is a, a, a well-suited topic uh, by chance. And the vanishing ghosts are charcoal kilns. In the late 19th and early 20th century, there were hundreds of charcoal kilns throughout the Upper Peninsula. Uh, they were part of the heritage. I don't think I used the word heritage in my, in my paper. I used culture. That's kind of the same thing in, in a sense. And the tourists loved them. They were called Paul Bunyan's beehives, or sometimes igloos. And the charcoal kiln supported, if you look at the early economic history of the Upper Peninsula, was iron production. And part of that was <clears throat> iron smelting, and you couldn't have had iron smelting without the charcoal. Charcoal was a subsidiary industry. It was tied into the smelters directly. They, they hired charcoal done. And there was a lot of enterprise outside of the smelters that supplied the smelters. So it's a full industry in its own right, subsidiary supplying the charcoal iron furnaces. And the fuel for these uh, furnaces, uh, the charcoal was produced in pits and kilns. There's a big difference. I'm going to, I'm going to define pit in a few slides, maybe use the term. It's, a, it's a, something that preceded the kilns for now. And I'm going to break this presentation into, into two portions. I'll cover the vanishing kilns at the second portion and give you background in the first, with the exception of jumping ahead and talking about one of the vanishing ghosts to give perspective first. The Carp River Iron Company built a furnace at the mouth of the Carp River in 1872-73. It lasted until the early 20th century. And later in 1890, it built a bunch of kilns. Prior to that, it used charcoal pits. And at one time, there were 43 kilns that supplied that furnace. Uh, and some of them were in rows right along the highway, which ended up being US 41 South. Matter of fact, the location I'm talking about is three miles south of Weir City at the mouth of the Carp River. In the mid-1930s, most of them were destroyed. Ended up with two of them left. And they became landmarks. Matter of fact, that's a postcard. That's, that's specifically the front of a postcard. On the back it says, one of Marquette's landmarks are these, they, they welcome tourists. And notice in front there's a little sign. I had to put that sign, I think, I don't know. I had to put that sign there because so many tourists stopped and said, what are those things? And to save themselves stopping in the nearest gas station and asking, they put a little sign up. That sign's not there. But I think the equivalent, that sign, is there right this minute. And I, I suspect it says the same thing that was on the original sign from the 1950s. I don't know that. 
It says there were 36 kilns here, and these are the last two kilns, which isn't true right now. And I went and looked at that sign, and those two kilns are gone. And that sign, when I took that photograph a year ago, had been moved. That's at the waste treatment plant. And they moved it around the corner to the driveway, and I, I assume they moved it there because they didn't want people stopping to look at it for safety. But I went up and took a photograph, and I was going to say the sign is still there today, so I went down and looked yesterday. I was surprised they moved it back. I think there's so much heritage involved, they had to have that sign just to show where the two kilns used to be. I was surprised that it was literally back at the location that, that it used to be at. It, was an, it just illustrated some historical oddities. And the two kilns ended up being eventually one kiln. People wanted to save it. There's a wood structure system there you can see. I don't know why they didn't get a mason to come in there. But they attempted to save it. That, that is the last kiln. And in 2016, I've got three headlines here. Mining Journal, historic charcoal kiln collapsed. You all probably know this, I'm sure. This is recent history. And the Iron Ore Heritage Trail Organization has, we got to save the kiln, we got to preserve it. And the Mining Journal says in 2020, history preserved. And I, I think everybody knows it's right, it's down there right now. There it is. And that welcomes tourists uh, to, the, to the town. It shows what people think in terms of heritage. I think the fact that sign was moved back shows that. It, it really surprised me that they put it back. And something interesting, look at that at the entrance right there, the opening. That's an eroded door. There was a small door. And the people that built that kin kill knew the size of the door because on the side you can see a little plaque. And on top of that is the old door, or it's the right size. I'm not sure it's the old door but it probably is, but it's a door the size that the door would have been. But instead of putting a, 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 right, a correct size door in that kiln, they put the old one that I think a generation of people realized when erosion happens on the kiln, it happens at the, there's a back door usually on these things, it happens at the door. And I think it was surprising to me that the generation that rebuilt it wanted it to look like the one they're used to as opposed to the proper one. If I was rebuilding it, I think I would have made the door the right size. So I think there's a lot of sentiment in, in why it, it's not correct. I, it is, it's correct in terms of what they remember. There have been lots and lots of articles. I could have a dozen in the newspapers from the 1940s and 60s when the kilns were all along the roads in good condition, the 70s too. And they all say there's a great opportunity to build a historic park. There's a great opportunity to save these kilns. And the other topic Dan mentioned, I, this is about opportunities lost too. But the opportunities were well recognized. Um, these are always in the Sunday newspaper. And the reason is they made a, they made a big story out of them, a page and a half, lots of photographs. Uh, I just picked a, plucked, plucked a little part out of each one. These are in uh, Stevenson, Michigan. But the effort was there, the recognition was there, easy to find in the newspapers. So background, quick background to start with. There were, in I chose 19, 1870s as a representative time period. There were 12 charcoal iron furnaces in Marquette County. You see three at some places. Most people consider a charcoal furnace a stack. And sometimes you had three of those. And they were three furnaces by, by proper definition. So there were 12 in Marquette County. There were seven others in the Upper Peninsula, uh, in Elger, Escanaba, uh, uh, Delta, and Menominee counties. So there were 19 charcoal iron furnaces right then. In addition, there were two that used coal or coke. Uh, and if you look at that, that's two out of 21. That's roughly 10%. They produced 20% of the output. They were big, and they failed. Charcoal just, uh, coal didn't work in the area. I'll tell you the reasons in a second. And by eight, but the 1880s, they were gone. And from the eight, early 1880s until the 20th century, well into the 20th century, it was 100% charcoal. So when you're talking about all that iron production that took place off smelting in the Upper Peninsula, you're talking about charcoal. The coal was, was even uh, several furnaces were built for coal and failed, and they con uh, converted to charcoal. Why charcoal? Well, basically, not, my background, I'm a forest economist, really, so I like to look at economic, it's economics. 
It's a lot cheaper to ship pig iron than it is to ship iron ore. Why ship the iron ore to Ohio to be smelted? Why not smelt it here and ship something a lot that weighs a lot less? So there's economics there. And coal was unavailable at first, and when it became available, it was too expensive. It never, never worked in the Upper Peninsula. It just, it just never worked. And besides that, the charcoal was preferred. When I say charcoal iron furnace, that's what the industry called them because they were proud. It was considered a better charcoal. It was a better charcoal for a lot of uses. Uh, so uh, it, was, it was a reason. They preferred to be using charcoal. They produced a better product. One, one thing, they, you say, why not wood maybe? Wood doesn't work for smelting. Charcoal produces twice the heat and it's concentrated. So it had to be charcoal and not wood. It's wood, but it's in charcoal form. And charcoal burns cleaner and, and faster than, than coal. So it wasn't the fact that they used charcoal because they couldn't get anything else. The fact is that's what they wanted to use. I'm gonna give you a little bit of technical background, very, very fast. How does a charcoal kiln work? Carbonization. Wood is primarily organic matter. It's 50% carbon and it's combined with gases, organic chemistry. Uh, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, and plus a lot of water vapor. And in the kiln, the kiln is sealed, there is a small fire that's burning to start with. And it gets the temperature up to 212 degrees. When you look at a kiln, the first smoke, and it's not smoke, but the first sm uh, smoke that comes off is white, it's water vapor, it's not smoke. And at 212, the water's gone, and it doesn't take much because they generally put, they dried the wood out first. Uh, once the water vapor is expelled, it'll burn a little while longer, but it'll quickly get up to five, 518 degrees. At that point, carbonization takes place. The wood isn't burning anymore. It's a chemical reaction. It's self-sustaining, uh, and it, it produces its own heat. And the wood is, is, they call it burning, it's called charcoal burning, but it produces volatile gases. That's, those are gases that should be burning, but there's no oxygen and they're expelled. And what happens in that process is there's a black residue left over. The gases are gone and that black residue is charcoal. The trick is, I said, and it's 50% carbon in terms of volume. If the oxygen is limited, the process just goes on. The collier, a collier is a charcoal maker, it has to have a lot of skill he keep make sure the oxygen is just a little bit. It's almost anaerobic. And, it, and if he fails, a fire starts very quickly because it's hot in there. The wood quickly becomes ash. That's a big deal because the charcoal maker wasn't paid for how many cords he put into a kiln. He was paid for how many bushels made it to the furnace. He didn't get paid. So it was very serious business. Now I'm a forester. I'm a forest economist. Forest economists also speak, uh, talk, teach, research, forest policy and forest history as part of our social science background. So I got interested in charcoal because it's wood and it affects timber supply. Look at that, that's charcoal. That might not look what you're used to, but the wood that goes in the charcoal briquettes is that. And it's ground up, some fillers that help it burn better, more uniform, are added to it. Look at the wood structure. I, if I could pick out one of those pieces and show it to you, I could actually show you the, the rings. The rings are in there. That, that is wood. It looks like wood. And I'm not going to give you the math. I could. I'm, I'm forced economists like to use numbers. And it's only addition and subtraction, but I'll, I'll give it to you in words. It takes so many bushels of charcoal to make a ton of iron. It takes so many cords of wood to make a bushel of charcoal. And it takes so many acres of land to make that bushel. And you can convert that back. And I'll give you the bottom line. Thousands and thousands of acres were clear cut, cut over, decimated due to the charcoal production. When you think of the cutover of the upper peninsula of, of the lake states, Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, you think of the lumberjacks coming in and cutting lumbering. And yes, that, that's what you should be thinking of. But what you don't think of, and it was really important, and if you're doing the forest history, you've got to get into it, the charcoal burners were taking a tremendous amount of wood. They loved the small wood, 
They, they, the stuff in the, so they could pack it tightly, they like four inch trees, small cordwood. They like to take what's made paper now. If they had to take lumber, they cut it into smaller pieces. They came in behind the lumberjacks and finished off the tracks because the small timber was left. And they went in the tracks with small timber and cut it. So I'm interested because I'm interested in timber supply and forest devastation. And if you study it in the Lake States, for example, you'd better cover charcoal production. Okay, I said I'd define pits. The technology, the people that, that did this came from Europe, mainly Italian Swiss. And I kind of wonder, I see a lot of references to Italians in the Upper Peninsula, and I haven't researched this, but I'll bet you if I did, I'd find this out. The people that built the kilns in the country were probably, because they were highly skilled masons and they knew how to build them in Europe. Uh, I know in the far west, they were definitely Italian Swiss that built them. And, but that technology comes from the before kilns. They were developed about the time it happened in the Upper Peninsula. Uh, people used ch charcoal pits. That's the tradi traditional manner. Um, the wood was put in the tiers in a mound of shape, maybe about 12 feet high or 15. It was covered with dirt, first leaves, then dirt. The leaves kept the dirt off the wood, totally sealed up like a kiln. Then it was burned the same way and produced. Matter of fact, there was a lot of argument when, when kilns were first developed. The pits developed better quality charcoal. The only thing you could say is because there's dirt involved, it was a little dirtier. But a lot of iron masters actually preferred pit, pit, pit charcoal because I think it was the colliers were so so had so much ability because that was the traditional manner they didn't do as well in the kilns. And that's a charcoal pit. You see three, the wood was usually in four foot sections so you could build, build even, even tiers. See the three tiers going up? In the middle they built a small chimney with wood. They had to do that because you had to put kindling in there and they lit it. They had to get the fire going. And so there was a small chimney in the middle Look at the side closely. See the leaves there? And then the dirt's over it. Notice the dirt is black. Actually, it was. You say, how would it, why is it dirt? The first, when they first built the first kiln, it was brown dirt. They had to be level. The fire has to burn uniformly down. You can't have it at a tilt, so, the fire, so it had to be extremely level. Put a lot of work into developing the hearth, 30-foot circle. And once they started, they put the kilns where the wood was, right in the center of it, and it took a couple weeks to do this. So once they, they made a kiln and, and got the wood out, they'd use the same site and build another kiln, then another kiln, and an, a pot pit, and another pit, and another pit. And they took the dirt off and used the same dirt to put it back on. It got mixed with charcoal dust, and very quickly it turned into something that was black due to the fact they were using, reusing the dirt. It's called charcoal dust. I've made pits. It works a lot better because the charcoal's light and it's a nice covering. So if you see any pictures of charcoal pits, I'll show you one. Usually the dirt is black because it's been reused. Matter of fact, there's one ready to, ready to be covered. Notice how tight it is. They took small wood called lap wood, about one to two inches and stuck it in between. You wanted it to be as tight as you could make it. There it is covered up. And the dirt does look black, doesn't it? Now there's a little hole on top. There's a chimney going down. These things have to be vented. If one side's not burning as, as much as the other, you put some holes in the bottom with a shovel handle, and that one is ready to light. The kilns, let's get into kilns now. In the Upper Peninsula, everywhere, not just the Upper Peninsula, there were four kinds. We're gonna talk mainly about beehive, but let me say before the beehive, there were other ones used, rectangular, round, conical, and, and beehive. Rectangular was a box, uh, it has a little bit of an arched roof you can't see in this photograph and a door in front, and it was just filled. Those didn't work well. They didn't burn very well. They didn't burn very evenly. The colliers never, never did well with them. They didn't last very long. They weren't popular. But there's a, on the side on the left is a kiln, uh, a rectangular kiln. That's Fayette on the Garden Peninsula. They got rid of that. I'm going to show you a later photograph, and there's conical kilns right where that was. So, but they were in the Upper Peninsula and didn't last long. Then there's round kilns. There's vents on the bottom, there's, a, there's an arch top, 
And I chose Ashland only because I got a postcard that shows really good detail. I could have showed you many of, many of these in the Upper Peninsula, but they're grainy photographs and you can't see the detail. So the only reason I switched, and Asheville's pretty close, but they look just like this. I, just, I like this one because the detail is in it. Then there's conical. Look closely, because I'm going to say the definition is, is hard between a beehive and a kiln, and, and a beehive kiln. That looks like a cone, doesn't it? And I say, just by definition, it's, it's kind of hard to define them, but that is a kiln. That, that's a conical kiln. That's at Fayette. Matter of fact, that's sitting right where the rectangular one was. That, they replaced them with those. The beehive, the main thing is it's supposed to have a, a, a dome on the top. That doesn't really have a dome, and it's kind of conical. You could argue that's conical, but being the sides that aren't exactly conical, and it does kind of have a dome, that's the one at Marquette. I'd call that a beehive, but people could argue with me. Matter of fact, that's an 1878 ad in the mining journal. That's a beehive. And the reason I put it in there was when they said it looked like a beehive, that's what they're talking about right there. Now, how did they work? They're made of stone or brick, two doors, one on the bottom, and then the other side on the two-thirds of the way up on the back was another door. Uh, there were vents on the bottom. And there was a ramp to get to the top door because I said it was two-thirds of the way up, and this might be 25 feet tall. So you needed, you couldn't use a ladder to carry the wood up. And I'll show you a photograph of a ramp going up, but that's, that's how they worked. Wood was loaded and unloaded to the upper and lower doorways. The kilns were always built there a slope or an embankment so you could put that ramp in. And the bottom, usually two to four, almost always three rows of, of vents. And the vents were brick-sized. Brick-sized because you almost kept the kiln. You didn't have many, much air, very little air. Kilns were anaerobic. But if you needed some air, you could pull a brick out and put a brick back in. The doorways uh, had heavy iron doors. I'm going to give you an example. And they're, they're not from the, North, the UP. I could easily have given you ones from the UP. But I've got a reason. So I'll tell you the reason later. These are intentionally not from around, around here. Look at the shape. That's the way beehive kilns look. See that? Uh, and I'm going to show you uh, some from uh, Onada that look just like that with the smoke coming out. But that's in Wyoming. Front doors. That's in Nevada. See the front door? That, that's, that's the way the front door should have looked on the one in, in Marquette. But they didn't do that because, I, like I say, I think they just, that generation didn't think it should look that way. It should look the way it used to look. Notice there's some vents on the side, too. These are in, in Utah. There's the, uh, not two-thirds, usually two-thirds up. That's halfway. Kind of see the embankment on the side? There was a ramp going to that, that upper door. And that, that's on the back. The front door was in the front. On the top, you can't see it because I don't have a drone looking down. It had a small hole. It had an iron door on the top. People had to go up there for different reasons. Maybe they needed to open it a little bit so some smoke could come out. There's lots of stories of people falling through that door. The door shifted and they fall into the kiln. I had a slide, one that happened to the Carp River kiln. And I took the slide out because I thought I'd upset you all. Because it, it was in, I think, 1880 or something. And those newspapers in the days gave really good details of what happened when you fell into the kiln. It was too gory, so I got rid of it. And there's the vents on the bottom. You can kind of see there's two, and at the bottom, the dirt came up. There's a third one. You can kind of see it. There's almost always three vents. And of course, that's a bottom door next to where the vents are. That's in the Pier, Wisconsin. See coming off the embankment? That's, that's, kind of, that's how the ramps work. If you didn't catch it, these kilns looked almost alike, didn't they? That's because the same guy drew the plans for them. So they were, they were developed on all these places. That guy was James C. Cameron. He was a mining engineer here. And he came in when the, when the beehive kiln was being developed. And he claims to be the inventor of the beehive kiln. I, I don't know if that's true. He certainly developed a, a, a type of it. And I consider him the Johnny Appleseed of charcoal kilns because he moved to Wisconsin 
and developed a whole series of, of, of beehive kilns. Uh, the the uh, Lake Superior ores went down there for smelting, and Green Bay, Fond du Lac, Appleton, De Pere, all those kilns and along the railroads going out were beehive kilns, and they used his plan. And Cameron went down there for a couple of years, was supposed to come back, but ended up moving out west to Salt Lake City, and ended up kind of subcontracting out the, the plans. And he had a series of kilns built in Nevada, the Utah, the Death Valley, and Idaho, and Montana, and Wyoming. And at the bottom, I got a quote out of a federal report it said these kilns, style of kilns was first built by J.C. Cameron in Marquette County, Michigan in 1868. If you go through all those western kilns, you look at the signs that are on them. Notice some of the ones I showed are really good shape. They all say this is the Cameron kiln. And some history you might not know of Marquette, it's accredited all over the United States for, for, for beehive kilns. Uh, developed by Cameron right here in, in Marquette County. Just a little bit, I kind of said this already. The wood was brought in through the lower door, set on the floor in a spoke pattern, and that spoke they left a little, there's no chimney, because they didn't need to prop it, because in the, in the uh, pits they had to put the road, in, uh, they had to load the uh, wood slanted, and you had to have a chimney built. They left the center, in, a little hole in the center, put kindling in there, and it served as a chimney. They also made a small little row of kindling to the door so they could light it there and it would burn in and then burn up. Uh, the layers were stacked really, really tight, horizontally and tight. Always the wood is trying to get the wood as packed, packed as tightly as you can. Um, the the uh, remainder of the kiln, uh, I think I already said all this. The cooling process was started by lighting the kindling at the bottom would burn over, then burn up. The heat would be at the top of the kiln. Once it got up to 518 degrees, you just sealed it off, and then it burned uniformly down. It had to burn uniformly down, and the cold air could tell by the color of the smoke, the odor of the smoke, the amount of the smoke, what was going on. You could tell by the heat on the side. Maybe this side's not burning as, much, as heavily. They could just pull one of the bricks out, and it would get hot. That's what the, all the ventilation was controlled, but it, not a lot of ventilation, but it was controlled. You had that kindling that burned out in the middle. You had a, so you had some place for the, vent, for the air to the vent. But that was the trick. Fire burned from the top down, and you had to keep it. You wanted it to burn evenly. So when it got to the bottom, the entire wood was all converted to charcoal. And when you... Actually, when I just say when you actually got the fire going, everything was sealed and the bricks were pretty much in place. When the process was complete, it took several weeks, the whole thing was sealed off, the charcoal was allowed to cool, and once it cooled, it was taken out and taken to the furnace. Very important, the collier was, in terms of the structure of an iron company, was in terms of pay, was right up there at the top. It was a really high quality skill. The people that helped him didn't get paid much. The people that chopped the wood didn't get paid much. Collier was considered upper management. He was in t really, really important. And if he didn't cool, the, cooling the coal was a, was a big part of the process. You had to have it cool, you wanted to do it as quick as you could because you could get another pit going. And you're trying to have economic efficiency. But if you set it off too fast, it catches on fire. You put it on a charcoal wagon and it's going in and it catches on fire, you don't get paid. Colder got paid for the charcoal that ended up at the furnace, not the stuff that burned in between. There's a furnace that was on that list of kilns, Bay Furnace, about 35 miles east of here. O Onada, not the one I'm going to, there were two Onadas, the first one, was a big village next to the furnace. A teamster was taking wood through the, the town, it caught on fire. He quickly unhitched the horses to save the horses. The wagon caught on fire. It was a windy day. The whole village, whole village burnt a catastrophe. I don't know what the collier had to pay for that because he's responsible. Big deal for the collier. A charcoal wagon was special. The planks on the bottom, 
weren't, weren't uh, bolted to the, the, the bottom. They could pull them out. They took horseshoes and, and bolted them to the planks, leaving a little space at the notch of the, of the horseshoe where you could put a chain in there. And the collier, a uh, teamster carried a chain. If the caracal caught on fire, he could find a tree or something. They'll put one end of the chain on, put the chain on the hook at the end of the planks, and pull the bottom of the charcoal kiln out. The charcoal would fall to the ground. You'd lose it. That's cheaper than losing the, the, the uh, wagon. And actually, that worked well at the furnace. You could also pull it out and unload the charcoal with it. So cooling was, you don't think of it a big part. It was a big part. Everything was by the color and odor of the smoke. I actually go and volunteer, and, and I could do it because I've done it for 20 years. I like to actually go to charcoal pits. It's done a couple of places around the country. And I can tell by the, by the color, the amount, and the uh, odor of the, of the smoke exactly what's going on in that kiln and when you, when you might have a leak, which is important. When... Um, Let me just jump here to show you the kiln. There's one. See the wood horizontally? See the kilning in there? See the guy with the ramp fixing to put it in the upper door? When, you, when I start talking about kilns, that's the way they looked. People wanted to save these things. Like I say, I could find a dozen articles. Um, only two places, I say opportunities lost, Fayette and Marquette are the only two places that really made an effort. I know this is the slide, one of my slides I talk about suggested effort. It never amounted to anything. Lots and lots of articles that said we got to save these things. That's Wilson. That was some of the best ones. That's the way they looked along the road. I'm going to show you a picture of that kiln today. I took the photograph from the road. That's how close they were. That one is in Stevenson. I showed a different version of it earlier. These are all articles in the Sunday paper, and underneath they talk about historical preservation and tourism. We've got to do something. There's a great opportunity here. Okay, the vanishing ghost. In, 18, in, in 1978, I had a, it was a, there was a survey done and it looked at all the engineering structures around the state and charcoal kilns were included. The, the existing ones, there were pictures taken of them. I went back and took a look and seen what they look like today and what opportunities were lost. There are two areas, Marquette, there's the places I looked at. And I already covered Carp River, 1872. Charles Schaefer called the Elger County uh, Charcoal King. He was involved with the 1890 kilns. Actually, they were there because there's a state prison nearby. And there was a thousand cords of hardwood and from the newly opened Marquette State Prison. And that's where the kilns ended up along the highway. That's the one, the last one that ended up not surviving. That's the one that ended up being the resurrected, as I called it. Another one, though, 16 miles south of Harvey, was the, the, the Manga, Manga Gum uh, charcoal kiln. Uh, it was part of probably 16 kilns that were behind the Carp River firm. It's five miles southeast of right here. Uh, if I got anything in quotes, it's from the survey. These kilns are 20 feet in diameter at the base and 20 feet high. Rough, coarse stone. They got the openings, they're just like a regular kiln. That's the way it looked in 1978. That's the way it looked today. That's the way a door should have looked in that Marquette kiln. See the, the structure right there? And that door I showed you on the other one, that was the upper door. There's the upper door, it's gone. Opportunity lost. You know, not all charcoal kilns were in the survey. The northern furnace, five miles south of here, mouth of the Chocolate River, uh, there were a dozen more kilns uh, right there. And I looked at that with a satellite image. 
while they weren't included in the seven day inventory, just to make a point, their ground level foundation is still there. Matter of fact, that's somebody's yard. There's three of them there. I knew there were more. You could tell that he, put, he has mulch over the end. I, I knew they went off. I didn't know there were a bunch of foundations in the woods when I talked to the landowner he showed me. That's the way it looks in his yard. So there's, in the survey, they wouldn't have considered that a foundation. I consider that still a foundation because you can see it. And in the woods, that's three foot tall. There was at least six of these things in the woods. So they're hidden in plain sight. There's plenty of, I could find hundreds of these within Marquette if I was to go out and look like that. Another area really intense with kilns was along the Detroit, Mackinac, and Marquette Railroad. Today it's a, it's a, it's a not the railroad, but a trail. There were 35 kilns within 20 miles of Marquette. And the biggest location was the Onata Station. And the kilns were built in 1881 and acquired by Charles Schaefer. Charles Schaefer's all over the history of, of these charcoal kilns. He was an entrepreneur. He worked on furnaces and he worked on charcoal kilns. There were 14 kilns at this location. In quotes again, what the, what the survey said, uh, th there were the one kiln and one rune and a building 15 by 25. The structure still standing is 25 feet in diameter, approximately 25 feet in height. The definition of what constitutes a kiln is subjective. I found a lot more foundations. I'm not going to argue with the survey because they had their own definitions of what a foundation was. I think even the ones in the yard would count. That's out of a, an artist drew that for a, a book of uh, interesting things along the railroad. Think back to Wyoming. See the way they look? See that those are probably beehive kilns? Tourists love these things. Think of what that looked and smelled like if you were on the railroad. There's the big one today. It's got moss on it. They're really pretty out there in the woods. You can see that and walk right off the woods and see that. There's one of the, probably the one he called the surviving foundation. That's one of the nicer ones. Nearby, three miles, and usually these things are exactly so many miles apart because there are railroad stations, is Rock River. He didn't include Rock River because it's a, it's a Forest Service interpretive site and protected. Originally, there was a set of circular kilns and 10 other beehive kilns for 12. The embankment near it is, is really uh, pronounced. I found significant foundations and remnants. Um, right there is, is one of the kilns. It looks, you can see, the Forest Service considers that enough to make an interpretive site. There's a foundation. Some of them aren't in very good shape. But these are all within Marquette. You can go out and, and look at the remnants right now. They're still there. And there are mainly opportunities lost. In the southern part of the state, around Escanaba, there's the Fayette Kiln I talk about and some other ones. The second recorrected one is Fayette. And they were next to, there they are, they're conical. You can tell sometimes it's obvious. Those are conical kilns. That's where the rectangular ones were. That existed there before they made the state park and people talked about saving them. By the time they did it, there's a, a small original one. The bigger one is the one that's there now. I don't know why they didn't try to save that smaller one. There it is today. It's conical. The rest of them, they're along the railroad. This is Daggett. Those are, uh, look kind of, kind of conical. I'd say, uh, probably beehive. I'd say the definition is, is variable. That's the reason tours saw them, because you know the roads are right along the railroad. Park River Kilns, 12 miles west of Escanaba, uh, three quarters of a mile north of town. It says these were Carp River Iron Company Kilns, probably Charles Schaefer. Uh, he leased them. They went that far. Carp River needed wood. The furnaces closed down. It was often because they lacked wood. They went all the way over to Escanaba to get wood to bring back to Marquette. Uh, these were conical. Actually, the guy in the book went back and forth, I, I'm, and I'm not sure I agree with, but, but they're conical looking. 20 feet tall, overgrown with trees. I'm a forester. I thought it was just out in the woods. They lack tops, described as neat. And the people, when I went there, I had a hard time finding them, and I asked some local people. Nobody even knew it. If you look at the history of Bark River, it was a charcoal burning, burning town. 
Uh, today, there are three substantial ruins and three foundations. The new town hall in Bark River was built from bricks from charcoal kilns from someplace else. That's why a lot of them don't exist. If, they, if somebody wasn't using them, somebody stole the bricks. See it right there? That's in the woods. That's a pretty substantial sign. You can look inside and see the vents. There's the door. And very unusual, they had an iron door still there. Usually they're stolen. Six miles west of Bark River, 1872, and the Escanaba furnace built 49 kilns between Escanaba and Powers, 22 miles. That's over two, two per mile. Not other in groups, but averaging. Uh, there are six kilns and a foundation at Wilson. Uh, they were some of the best standing in the state, 25 feet tall. In 1860, 46 article called them some of the best preserved in the state. You, I got a picture, they, they looked nice. Matter of fact, in 78, that's the way they looked. Just like Marquette, the doors went first. See how big they were, what they looked like? I, I, you can see these from the road. Not US 2041 today, go across the railroad track and old US 41, you gotta be on to see these. Look how they looked, that's what the tour saw. For, it, there they are today. There's trees growing out of the top. See the vents at the bottom. I took that from the road. There they are in a row. There's the back. That's what happened to them, unfortunately. Stevenson, down 25 miles down the road, and all these are along Chicago and Northwestern Railroad, which is also 41. Um, location is two miles to the east. And I'm surprised that was one I showed you earlier they wanted to make a park out of. I think they're interesting enough, they figured they'd get people to drive two miles over to see them. They produced for the Menominee uh, Furnace. They said there were five kilns standing in the, in the ruins of a sixth. Conical, you can tell that these are really beehive. Uh, 25 foot in diameter, 20 feet high. Remarkably good condition. That's in 78. Notice the door looks like Marquette. That's not a good picture, but that was from 72. You can tell they look pretty nice. That's it today. There they are in a row. I call that, that's pretty typical. I call that what you called earlier is uh, opportunity lost. Look at that right there. I know I've gone a little bit long. Questions? I went fast at the end. I was gonna go faster, but I was watching my watch. <laughs> Actually, you're right on time. So we have, any, so we have a question back here. I was struck by the ruins in the forest. I love that kind of searching and hunting and finding them. And it would be great if there was a website with a map with little kiln icons showing where the foundations are so that I can go out and see them. That, that, could, that could be done. Uh, there, matter of fact, I was surprised. I mentioned most of these are private property you could call them. I didn't stress it, but they were. I had no problem with any landowner giving me permission to go out there. Matter of fact, uh, it was the opposite. Oh boy, will you tell me something about them? And if anybody wanted to do something like that, it'd be very easy to do. I mentioned earlier, I was talking to somebody, I said, I'm tempted to tell stories. I'm gonna tell a story. Bark River was founded on economics of, of charcoal burning, that, that town was. I went there and I couldn't find the kilns. I had them located by satellite image and I was wrong. So I went up and I asked somebody that was in the yard right where I knew they were supposed to be. The Delta County Historical Society told me that they were there too and I, I knew from my research. He called somebody, it was a Sunday, Bark River is a small town, so a Clemson professor coming in and asking questions was big news. And before I left town, somebody beeped their horn at me and said, I might know where these are. And I said, great, I'll take you to the owner. I went to see the owner and he said, maybe, let's go out and look. We went out and looked. And he didn't know what they were. The owner didn't know what they were. And he, was, he had a hunting group that, that hunted in his woods and they didn't know what they were. The one guy who stopped me said, he thought they were charcoal kilns, he wanted me to confirm it. I ended up going back to his yard and he had a trailer and I sat on it and I told the owner stories. He got on his phone and told his hunting par party. They came for the next half hour, it was Sunday, nothing to do, it wasn't football Sunday probably. I sat there telling stories about these kilns to the local people, and they thought they were UFOs. They thought they were, I mean, literally, I was, and, and I had to sit there and tell them what they were. I couldn't believe that a town founded on, on charcoal burning 
that virtually nobody in town had any idea what the, what the charcoal kilns were. Uh, but you're right. There's, there's opportunities here. What I was hoping was, and I don't see too many students, but I hope they're watching. The students tend to watch it. Somebody picks up on some of this and calls me up in South Carolina and says, will you help me write an article? There are so many things like that that could be done. destination. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, an empty your comment about uh, tourist destinations. Uh, I wish my friends from Chicago had been here uh, for this because uh, they told me that their parents who were sailors would come up from Chicago to Fayette, to the Garden Peninsula, to see the charcoal kilns. Uh, so in fact, they've been a tourist destination for a long time. Uh, and then uh, a question, why did the uh, uh, charcoal kiln industry uh, decline? Lack of wood. I mean, it, it was forest devastation. Um, it's, when you go through and you read the literature, fully ab able to operate smelters. And their smelters were expensive. And they're sitting there, and there's plenty of iron ore. It's always in the newspaper article. And more times than not, it wasn't any demand for iron smelting. They it literally ran out of wood. The charcoal became too expensive. They, they pulled it in. Remember I said Charles Schaefer was pulling wood in the Marquette from down to Escanaba. That's how bad it got. And what happened was a big reason that the smelting declined was forest devastation. You think, that, no, I, don't, I, I teach forest conservation. And you always start out, the wood is inexhaustible. That, that's what people, when the, when the pilgrims started, they looked at the wilderness. The wood is inexhaustible. We don't have to worry about anything with the wood. Uh, it always starts out that way. When the first people looked at the Upper Peninsula, it was inexhaustible. It turns out it is exhaustible. And they, they literally cut themselves out of business. It was the fuel. The charcoal kilns went down because there was no wood to put in the charcoal kilns. And subsequently, the, the iron furnaces went down. So uh, it was a lack of wood. Wow, that's, that's fascinating. Does anyone else have another question for Tom? Just to address the, your suggestion about mapping, you're going to learn more about that with the uh, Keweenaw Time Traveler, which Dr. Lafrenia is going to talk about in a little bit, uh, because that's an online version of something, that, a resource that we're going to be expanding soon. So that was a great question, very timely. Does anyone else have any other questions for my, my great, great grandfather ran, was the supervisor of the charcoal kiln in Forestville here in Marquette. And uh, this was really fascinating time because I'd never really understood exactly what he did and what he was supervising. Um, and that was in 1870. He was in the 1870 census as a supervisor of the kiln there. Uh, by 1880, he wasn't working. <laughs> and uh, that kiln was out of business, and now I know why. They ran out of ran out of wood. But, uh, but your grandfather had what was considered an upper level managerial job. That was... Yeah, I that, never uh, understood that. That, that. that was a big deal. Uh, I say the people, your grandfather and the Colliers, if you look at the structure of, of the iron companies, the top level people, the uh, Colliers are right up there because they were, they, that was a super important skill. Uh, now the people below that, they were workers. I mean, that, but, uh, you know, they were woodcutters and the rest were, were lower level. But the upper level charcoal people were, had important jobs. Yeah, he was a French Canadian. He came from Quebec. So there were a lot of uh, people from Quebec working in that industry at the time. Is there anything left to the Forestville kilns? There's some foundations. There is an interpretive sign out there, right? When you cross the bridge, there's an interpretive sign on the trail there. Um, but yeah, very little is out there. Probably some foundation stuff, so. Yeah. Rainy Creek out there actually was named for him. He was Rene Trottier. He saved a child who was drowning in that creek and they named it for him. It's worth noting that uh, Marquette was still producing charcoal in the 1960s and 1970s. Cliff Dow had a charcoal briquette plant down here and I think they had four kilns uh, related to that, I, one of my summer jobs was working in the furnaces in the kilns, and it gave you a pretty good glimpse of what hell was like because 
uh, they didn't like to let those things sit idle very long, and it was always a fine line about when they would open the doors on the kilns, and sometimes they would explode because the gases were in there. Uh, sometimes the uh, railroad uh, cars that they used to uh, host the wood for the charcoal would get derailed, and people would have to go in there with jacks and levers and everything and, and in that hot oven and try to get those things out. It was quite a process, but you know, we were still doing it a long time after these things anyway. You make a really good point. If you get into the charcoal and you start going beyond, I, did, I had only 50, but you could tell I had three hours worth of stuff. But if you, if you get into it, I could have taken it a lot farther. I mean, you're, you're right, it's ingrained. I don't think the popu current population understands the history of what that is to the Upper Peninsula. I mean, and, and there's a lot of variations that go way beyond. I stayed on, on the main track. You went off the main track. There are plenty of places to go off. Uh, later on, uh, you're right, all the way well into the 20th century, there's charcoal production going on. So, so you're right, that was a good point. carbide uh, operation in the Sioux up until the 1960s, and didn't that involve charcoal kilns? Maybe somebody here. I'm not here. sure. There, yeah, there, there were there are different places. I have to go back and look. You get into, when you get into uh, the latter part of the, not even the latter part, past the beginning of the 20th century, chemical companies came in. And the chemical companies, what they found out was you could make and what they found out was the volatile gases that were going out were worth more than the wood in some cases. And then they, there was a lot of, so they changed over. So I, I have, to, have to sit there and look and see what exactly is involved there. But the chemical companies were making, making chemicals. And, even, and the idea was they were making charcoal for furnaces, but the charcoal turned out to be secondary because they found out the gas was worth more than the charcoal. So, so the name changed from charcoal per, com, XYZ charcoal company XYZ chemical company, but it was still a charcoal company. Like I said, I could have sidetracked off all, all kinds of places. The charcoal was ingrained, so that's another good point, ingrained into the history of the Upper Peninsula. Wow, this has been fascinating. And if you have any other questions for Tom, you could ask him during the break or at lunch or later. We I are going to take a short break and get ready for our next speaker. So let's hear it for Tom. Fantastic presentation, Tom. <laughs>